Hello and welcome back to the Nikon Theater Stage. How are everybody doing this morning? We good? Feeling good out of the rain? Because the weather's nasty outside. How many of you love taking pictures on the road or traveling? Uh, I have been admiring the work of these three photographers that we're going to have today. And different than some of the other shows they're doing on their own, um, we wanted to have a bit of a panel discussion, not to talk so much about f-stops and shutter speeds, but to really get into their mindset, how they prepare, what they do as travel photographers. I do not consider myself much of a travel photographer, that's why I'm so inspired by them. But let me introduce this esteemed panel to you right now. Let's start with night landscape photographer Adam Woodworth. Welcome. Hey everyone. Buddy, nice to see you, buddy. I've been following this woman, and so have many, for, uh, millions of them for many, many years. Deb Sandage. And this cat, this guy, I've started looking at his work for the last several years. And, and like the work of our other panelists, I, I, it's like eye candy to me. It's the kind of stuff I need on my walls everywhere I turn for inspiration. And he goes into some very dangerous places and just recently was in Hawaii dealing with volcanic activity. Mike Mezuel II. Appreciate it, bud. Thank you, Michael. So, to me, it's, it's always interesting to know where a photographer's come from and where they've started from. And I know, Adam, you have a unique story about <laughs> your background, your past, and a transition in photography. What did you do before photography? A uh, software engineer for like <laughs> so, 15, 20 years, something like and that. And what, what made you turn to photography? Uh, well, I've been into photography of some form like most of my life, you know, I can remember. And in 2008, I bought my first digital SLR, and I had film cameras before that in college. And um, I just got hooked on it and um, eventually just became so into it that I decided that this is my new life, you know, and I can finally leave my desk job behind, you know. Was it a tough transition going from a desk job with a normal paycheck to moving yeah, into the field it's, and running I mean, business? You know, it's a challenge, you know. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's still a work in progress, but, you know, it's still a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. Deb, when did you first pick up a camera and know photography was what you wanted to do? Oh, I'd say I've always been involved in art in one form or another, and so sort of. there's a lot of things that kind of brought me to the point where I was very interested in uh, working with a camera. So my first real camera was the D100, which I quickly converted to infrared. <laughs> so, and so I got very, very interested in, in that aspect of um, creativity. So I, I felt like that led me to photography and working with the idea of uh, infrared and, and, and working a little bit in Photoshop with some digital digital animations and things, so. Mr. Mezuel. Yes, sir. Second. What brought you to photography? Uh, I got my first film camera when I was 15. Uh, it was a birthday gift, and uh, I knew nothing about photography, but my father gave it to me, so we were really competitive, and he said he didn't know how to use it. So I did uh, very manly things. I didn't have a car. I went out and I photographed dead ladybugs and flowers and stuff like that to learn photography, and I wrote down each frame mm -hmm. what I can do differently next time. And uh, from there, it was just a snowball. I wanted to learn more and more and more. So I uh, went and I checked out uh, books at the library and eventually grew into uh, where I'm at now. Mm -hmm. Deb, when you first got into this, did you study other photographers? Who were the people that were interesting to you in the way of travel? I was very interested in a lot of the contemporary photographers that, that were around me and, and watching what they're doing, the type of creative work. A lot of people were working with uh, we had Tony Sweet working with the macro. You know, we had um, some people, uh, some other photographers working with a lot of creative ideas. So I was inspired by, I'd say, more contemporary. But the first person was Bristai. I, I loved his black and white work. And I, I looked at his book, Paris by Night, and I was just completely taken by how beautiful and how romantic. And I think that's what inspired the travel cars, that I want to be able to do this. Right. Adam. Who, who, who led you to be inspired as a photographer? Who? Oh, man. Uh, my, my local, sort of, so to speak, photographers in like Maine and New Hampshire right. that I would find who were, like, were t taking amazing pictures of the landscapes up there. So friends, people like Jim Salji and uh, Chris Witten and uh, many other people. Oh, I'm going to forget their names right now. Mm -hmm. But it was a lot of the local people in my area because I would see photos all the time of the West and stuff like that. And that's what's really well known, but you don't really see many photos of the East as much, you know. Right. So it was really interesting to see the local people up there, you know, other photographers in my area, 
taking amazing photos, and I just strive to kind of do what they did. Right. You know. Mike, who's inspired you? Uh, I think uh, kind of like Adam said, the local photography group. You know, I live in Dallas. There's really not much landscape to shoot around there. So seeing what they were doing going out really made me go, okay, well, why am I sitting at home? I need to right. get out there. There's a world to explore. And then obviously, you know, just seeing the professionals out there, the uh, ambassadors at the time, their work was uh, inspiring. So it just pushed me to go. Is there any, Mike, is there anything in particular that drives you to do what you do? Is that, that drive that passion? I mean, all of you travel. I mean, any of you that are into travel photography, you have to make a commitment. Um, but what, what drives you to want to make these pictures? You know, uh, one, I just, I love the world we live in and I feel extremely uh, blessed that I get to do this for a living, I get to travel and I receive messages all the time from people who say, you know what, I can't see that, I'll never get to see that. And if it weren't for your images, um, I never would. I would never even get close to seeing that. So that always stays in the back of my mind of, hey, you know what, I'm cold, I'm hungry, but you know what, somewhere out there, somebody's wishing they could be exactly where I am. So that motivates me to keep going out there and creating the best images I can. Deb, how, how often are you on the road? If you were to weight the percentages of home and on the road, what would that percentage break be? Ooh, head. Well, the last few years, it's been pretty intense. So it would be two or three weeks out of the month right. <laughs> and come back. But it's an adventure. Um, you know, I love traveling. I love the experience of being in new cultures, of being in new locations. And, and I love being able to address maybe an artistic part of an image. So I know everybody's going to go to a lot of locations and come away with a lot of similar images. But I want to put Deb into that. I want to put something that's sort of my, my creative input. It seems like everywhere you go, though, you are a travel photographer, so it doesn't matter what city you're in, you're making pictures. What did you do while you were here in New York? Oh, I took pictures. I had my Nikon D7. Where, where did you go? Some of these Times people here are locals, Square. I'm sure. <laughs> huh? Went to Times Square, went down to Brooklyn Bridge Park. I was the only photographer there. There was no one else there. So I brought one camera, one lens, Z7 and the 2470, and it was beautiful. But there's something, there's a feeling that, that I get, just being by myself, taking pictures. I feel like I'm very much a part of the environment. And, and it's, uh, you kind of get lost in the photography part of it. It's a special feeling. I'm sure you guys experience that same thing. Yep. Adam, you, you, are, you specialize in night landscapes. So what attracted you to night landscapes as opposed to doing anything during the day? Uh, <laughs> I do a lot of stuff during the day, but um, I've always had a fascination with space and the stars and all that. And uh, just it's a lot of fun. Once you start doing it, you know, you just kind of get hooked on it. Mm -hmm. Being out alone at night under the stars, it's like quiet. Um, and especially going to places where you can see the Milky Way with your naked eye is kind of an eye-opening experience and you start to realize all these other things about your life and the planet and space and it's just kind of a, a crazy experience once you start and getting into it. I noticed um, through the years of knowing you that you had once posted a movie of the, the process of photographing at night. It's not really just taking that picture, it involves more than just shooting the picture, is that right? Yeah, oh yeah, there's lots of planning that goes into it and uh, being careful with where you go and all that. But yeah, it's a uh, long, sometimes it's an easy process, sometimes there's an enormous amount of work that goes into bef before you even arrive at location, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of planning involved. Sometimes. What do you do? Do you research on the web? You, what do you do essentially to prepare for a trip? Like what's the next trip you're going on and how do you prepare for that? Uh, let's see, next trip, I don't have anything special planned right now, but I have... Okay, the uh, last trip you were on, yeah, right. how did you prepare for it? last trip I was on, I was chasing the fall colors through Maine and Eastern Canada, and that was a lot of following social media to see where the colors were peaking, mm -hmm. and then I go, okay, they're doing good over here, I can go over there for a while, then I can go down here. Um, but when it comes to like night landscapes, there's a lot of maybe, if I haven't been to the location before, there's a lot of Googling around and, and seeing images from the area, looking at satellite maps, Using apps on your phone like Photopills to actually plan out stuff. Right. Um, watching the stars, watching the light, when the sun's yeah, going to be up. Yeah, when's the moon going to be up, when the stars are going to be up, is it going to be angled right, you know? And then you get to location and then you have to like actually see it physically, will it work? Yeah. I think that's, that's an important point that technology these days, especially with the apps that are out there, so we can trail the, the weather conditions and the patterns yeah. and the light, 
where you want to be at the right time. I mean, I guess you're still getting up at you know three o'clock in the morning sometimes to hit sunrise, but it's well worth it when you do that. Mike, you do a lot more extreme work, and I know you did some work, what, from helicopters or from different positions. How do you prepare when you go to shoot? So when you went to Hawaii, how did you prepare? Yeah, um, you know, Hawaii was a whole no another ball game. Uh, there was a lot of surprises there, but you just have to be flexible. Mm -hmm. uh, you do have to have your shots in mind because up in a helicopter, you only have X amount of time. And you, you know, like I said, you have to be flexible. So in Hawaii, you know, a lot of times we were dealing with sulfur dioxide gases up in the air and mm -hmm. steam clouds and stuff like that. So the shot of saying shooting the fissure from the air didn't happen every time we're up. So we said, all right, you know, let's go down and focus on the uh, abstract shots down at the ocean entry. So, you know, you have this shot sheet in your mind and you have your goals for your images, but you also have to say, okay, I have plan A, B, and C because, you know, light, situations, conditions, all that is never, it rarely ever lines up exactly how you want it. So I think to you know, make the most of your time on these assignments or these shoots, you have to have a plan of action. And right. if you don't have that plan of action, that's where you stumble and you fall short. But if you have a plan of action, uh, it definitely helps with capturing great images. Right, and I mentioned that recently, Mike, spent time in Hawaii, volcanic activity happens, all of a sudden your heart and soul says, I have to be there. Is that what happens? Yeah, you know, I focus primarily on photographing tornadoes and severe weather in my photography career, but uh, volcanoes have always been number two. Mm -hmm. And so when I saw what happened, you know, I was immediately like, I'm going. And I'm not going to lie to you guys, I was scared quite a bit because this was new and different. But when I got there, um, you know, I felt right at home. I had a great group of gentlemen with the National Guard who were watching my back, which allowed me to focus on my shots and my images right. without going, am I going to die? Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, that was really uh, a great opportunity. Tell me some of the things you were very sensitive to. I know you mentioned what's happening there. It's not just about photography. Yeah, you know, there's a beauty to the destruction. And, you know, although the event was absolutely breathtaking to see, and the, you know, the nerdy science part of you wants to just lose your mind, you also have to be uh, cautious and aware that people have lost everything that they worked for. And this area of Hawaii was kind of the lower income area of Hawaii. So these people are already, you know, they, they put a lot of love and work into building their homes and their lives here. And then within a blink of an eye, it's gone. So you have to also take that into consideration of what you're shooting. There's a lot of images I shot on that event that I won't put out there. Um, or I want to you know, sell because I don't feel it's right. And uh, you know, it, it was a great event to see from so many different angles, but you also had to um, have a heart when you're out there shooting and know what you're shooting. Yeah, it's pretty extreme. Yes. I guess the, the sensitivity part is, is, is so important. Mm -hmm. So let's start talking a little bit about gear. Deb, what are your prime lenses when you go out for travel and landscape work, the work that you do? Well, it depends on what I'm shooting. So if I'm going to be shooting something like beach scenes, I love to reach for my Nikon D850, my 14 to 24 super wide lens. And I'll uh, work with that aspect of really wide, uh, and even into cityscapes. So that's going to transfer. But I, I usually carry my 24 to 70 everywhere I go. So I, I, I like that lens very much. And to isolate subjects, I'll use a 70 to 200 millimeter lens. So that's often very helpful so that sort of covers all the, all the bases of you know, the wide, the mid-range, and the zoom. Right, what would your favorite lens be right now? If you had one to go out with in New York City? I, I tell you, the one I just went out with, I loved. <laughs> it's the, it's the, I went out with the Z7 and the new 24 to 70 millimeter lens. I love my 20, as you know, my 24 to 70 f2.8. I've been using it for years. It's well loved, it's uh, kind of beat up a little bit. But I love that lens. That's uh, easy, kind of wide to mid range. I can get a lot with travel photography. It works out really, really well. But the, uh, the new lens, I, I had fun with that. It was very light. And for travel photography, who's carrying an own gear, that can make a big difference. So I, I know you use a lot of fisheye lenses, the, the fisheye zoom as well. Yes. What are the mistakes commonly people make with fisheyes, or how do you approach using the fisheye uh, lens? Oh, I, I always like to look at uh, the approach of using a fisheye creatively. So I love to work with a circular end at eight millimeters to get this beautiful circular image. I like to work with the 15. You get a really wide, wonderful view. Uh, and I like to point it straight up, get the sky, all the trees around me. But also, if you hold it level to straight, you get an ultra wide view. So for me, that's one of the most 
versatile lenses that I, I've traveled with. Since I got that lens, it hasn't got out of my bag. So <laughs> this, is, this is an example, pretty much. So you're I, I just think shot. it's stunning. It's just, yeah. it's a beautiful, and not everybody just looks at that same angle. So I would assume finding the right angle with that fisheye is critically It important. is, it's just a matter of adjusting and, and moving and, and finding it. And I, I always like to include a little sparkle into that. And that's just a, a matter of narrowing the aperture to f11 or it's right. seen getting a little sunburst into the shot and then adds glamour and, and beauty into the shot. So it's a simple, easy way to make it magic. So there you go. <laughs> Perfect timing. Adam, what lenses are in your bag? What do you typically go out with or teach your workshop students to do? Well at night there's pretty much just one lens. It's the Nikon 14 to 24 F28. That's 99% of my night shots are probably shot with that lens. But for daytime landscapes, it's that lens plus the 24 to 70, any version of it. Um, the new 24 to 70 f4 is great because it's small and light. And for daytime landscapes, I don't need a 2.8. Right. Um, and then the 7200 I actually use quite a bit too to compress uh, the landscape sometimes, and it works really well, especially if you're at a farm or something like that. And you want to punch in a bit, mm -hmm. um, but it can even work well with the mountains and things like that. So. 14 to 200 is kind of most of whatever it is. And, and a lot of cold weather gear because and a lot of cold weather gear. Sub temperatures, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Many See, layers. Deb spends a lot of time in Florida in the you know, early <laughs> cold days in New York, but uh, we go from one extreme to hot volcanic activity. <laughs> and you're, what's the coldest temperature you've ever shot in? Negative, uh, negative 10 without wind, negative 60 with wind. Anybody want to go to one of Adam's workshops? I, I'm not <laughs> sure. Uh, I haven't had uh, a we workshop We have some cold that weather yet, people but. out there. Michelle Valberg. Um, oh, that's right, you're from Canada, way up in the cold <laughs> north, I, I get it. Um, Mike, what's in your bag in the way of lenses? Uh, lenses, my, uh, my baby is my 14 to 24. So that, that is such a fantastic night sky lens and landscape lens. Uh, and shooting you know, storms, these storms have it's such incredible structure to them that you, know, you need that wide angle to, to capture it all. And I like to shoot uh, some really high resolution panos as well with that. So like a nine, that image with the Northern Lights there is a nine image panorama of the Northern Lights at 14 millimeters. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's my baby, but I also like to change things up. Uh, the 200 to 400 when I was in Hawaii was fantastic. I took that down to Patagonia as well. So there's a mountain shot coming up that that's a 400 millimeter shot. So uh, landscape photography, 14 to 24, but it's not set in stone. You know, you can get creative. Right. Exactly, with some of the larger uh, focal lengths. Mm -hmm. So those are my those are my babies. And so you mentioned, and I think that's important too, the multiple shots to create the panorama. Adam, on the back end of photography and the work you do, there's quite a bit of computer work that has to happen with stars. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit of that without going <laughs> crazy? But oh my God, yeah, know, an it, average photo. It's not as simple as walking in there shooting yeah. for two hours at night and 30 second or minute exposures. Yeah. There's more that goes into it, no? Yeah, after you get home. Um, it can take an average of two to four hours per photo that I work on. Um, some photos take days, um, but there's, you know, getting the stars right. So there's this method called star stacking that I do. And then you got to get the foreground exposures, like everything kind of prepped. Right. Yeah, like something like that takes a long time. And then you get everything sort of prepped and then you blend them together for dynamic range and focus because you're focusing on the stars and everything in the foreground is out of focus and dark. And then you got to take another exposure for the foreground. You got to blend that all together at some point. And then after two hours of doing that, you can do creative edits <laughs> and finally get somewhere with it. <laughs> so um, uh, Deb, are there challenges in what you do? What are the biggest challenges for you? Well, the biggest challenges, um, just looking to see what I'm going to get, situation I'm going to get into. So I try to do a lot of scouting and prep work and kind of know what, it, what I'm going into. But if there's a weather challenge, I kind of embrace it. <laughs> so it, it can be really beautiful and expressive, and that's the kind of thing. Um, I try to be careful where I go, you know, so I usually if I can bring someone with me, or if I can, uh, if I, but I go to familiar areas, so I, I'm pretty confident where I, where I go. And so uh, you just told me a story about meeting somebody somewhere you were standing next to in the dark, I did. and you I just did. happened to be at the same place at the same time. When the light came up, you guys realized you were standing next to each other. Who was that? I was, it was Mandy Lee. I was so excited yeah. because of all the places. Like, here he was in Colorado. I'd never been to this part, Maroon Bells and Aspen. And it was dark to get to this location. I was actually shooting stars at, at this time in the morning, about 4.30 AM. And I heard this voice, and there's Mandy and Kendrick over <laughs> right next to me. So it was really kind of cool and serendipitous that we would end up at the same place. Mm -hmm. So talking about the challenges, Mike, if you want to share, and I understand if you don't, <laughs> 
when did you get too close and you said to yourself, this is way too close? Are we talking, uh, which, which time? Um, <laughs> Just you know, give us one of those. <laughs> oh man, uh, you know, shooting the, uh, the Milky Way shot back there at the lava, that was kind of one of those moments that uh, I really wanted the shot. And I had a huge issue. I had a, a, a breakout of lava just to my left, and that was creating a pretty gnarly lens flare uh, in my 14 to 24. So I tried holding my hand out to be kind of like a lens hood. And that just wasn't doing it. So I ended up uh, standing to the left, putting the cable release on, taking the shot, singeing all my leg hairs off, and having the sexiest legs ever. Um, <laughs> and that was one of those moments that uh, I was like, I'm a little too close here. I should probably back off. Got the shots, but literally lost like all the leg hair on my hair. Sorry, on my, on my That's legs. a little too close. <laughs> a little, a little too close there, but. But it this was is worth coming it. from a guy that chases these storms that would throw like cars around and houses yep. around. Um, I, I assume that fascination is just the beauty of the weather. It's just outstanding. Yeah, you know the weather. I love photographing severe weather because it's one of those moments that it's there and it's gone, and you know nobody's ever gonna get that same shot. Mm -hmm. um, but once again, kind of like the the volcano, there's a beauty side of it and a destruction side of it. So seeing storms like the one that's going up behind us um, and in the middle of nowhere, that's what I love. When it turns into uh, something going through town, kind of back off a little bit, but nature is absolutely wonderful. And seeing these storms, you know, it's just air molecules up there, water molecules. And seeing that form, this beauty in the sky, that, is, that keeps me driven with that. So Deb, I want to turn to you for a little bit and change, shift gears a little bit because I think it's so important to promote, that the, work we, to promote the work we do. Um, especially the travel photography. There's a lot of competition out there. Um, talk to everyone about social and what you do socially. I think uh, when one of my colleagues, uh, Diane Birkenfeld, who runs our Learn and Explore uh, section of the website, came to me, she mentioned you had over a million Google Plus followers. How do, you, how do you dig into social? What is your social plan? How do you get your pictures out there? Well, I was one of the early adapters to Google, so that's sort of what happened, you know, that natural progression of... of but a million followers, that's Google <laughs> or Facebook or anywhere else, that's a lot of people following your work. Well, like, one of the reasons I like to be involved in social media is because I get inspired. I love seeing everyone's work, and, and, and I love that people ask questions, and I'm able to share ideas, and so that's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, I learn from the people that follow me. I and people learn, I love to give tips and inspiration ideas, but I feel like it's a great way to connect and, and be part of everything. So yeah, I, I like Instagram. I, I like that's, I say that's my first, first and foremost social media. Twitter's fun, Facebook is Facebook. <laughs> and Google is Google, yes. But. So Adam, how much socializing do you do of your work and, and how frequent and how do you <laughs> approach it all? And do you do it alone? I know some people hire social people to, uh, you know, a social yeah. specialist to run the social society, like, do you do it on your own? And how I often? probably should hire someone because I'm not very good <laughs> at it. Um, I do, you know, I try to do what I can. I get the stuff out there. I post when I have a photo ready. I don't really, not the best at social media. Let's put it that way. But Before, yeah. It, uh, and Mike, do you? What do you do in the way of social? I see your pictures uh, on Facebook quite a bit and Instagram quite a bit. Yeah, you know, social media is such a powerful tool these days that, um, you know, it's great to get your work out there. Um, and to inspire others, to push others to go out there and shoot. But it's also, for me, I just, I'm like a sponge. I look at what people are doing out there and I'm like, I want to do that, I want to do that. Holy cow, I wish I could be that good. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's such a, an amazing tool and it's important to use. Yeah, true, the most flattering thing as a photographer was someone wants the picture you have or you're envious of the picture they have and you exactly. have to go back and do that. Um, I'm going to work my way in as we start to wind down. This has been really exciting to me. Adam, best and worst places you've been to? What was the best place oh. you've been to that you remember? And what was the worst place you've ever been to that you had to try to make a picture? Oh my God. So many options here. <laughs> Good. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm from Maine, so there's a lot of amazing places I love to go up there. They're my favorite you, you spot. Pick your favorite. Where's that one place that you makes know. you feel pa impassioned and you just have to be there and you go back there again? Oh, I love going to Newfoundland, actually, which yeah. is not Maine, but... Um, there's just so many great scenes up there. Uh, I was in Alaska not long, a year ago, and the Dalton Highway, which is like 400 miles of dirt, mm -hmm. uh, goes up to the Arctic Circle, to the Arctic Ocean, was just an amazing experience. And like, there's just these beautiful mountains up there, the Brooks Range and all that. Uh, the worst experience, I don't know, like, it's usually I don't go out if it's like horribly bad, but because the weather and all that, you know, 
But um, I've been out in the rain plenty of times and at a waterfall and like you get beautiful shots, we gotta keep wiping the lens off, wipe the camera off, keep yourself dry. It's just tough situation. Yeah, you know, that it's probably the hardest is when you're out in the rain doing landscape stuff, for me anyway. Yeah. Where's your go-to place, Deb? What would you go back to again that you love, the place that you love the most and where have you had a tough place that you've been in? Ooh, or a not so fun that. place that uh. you'd avoid? Well, I love Cuba. It's beautiful. It's ever-changing. I've, I've been three times, and every time I go, it's absolutely amazing. And it, but I, I love all big cities, so you know, I, I embrace whatever happens when I go. But I think the most complicated places are some places that I revisit. I'll go to a beach that I know is absolutely gorgeous, and then I come back, and it's been re-sculpted by a hurricane. And all right. the rocks that were there are now covered. That's They're important. The transition of time changes things. Thanks. And it changes the pictures you make because they won't be back the same. Nobody can take that picture again, right? Well, ex exactly right. It's important to shoot it when you see it. Yes. <laughs> favorite place? Worst place? Oh, man. Are they all good? <laughs> they're, they're all good uh, in their weird, unique ways. Um, favorite place is probably, I just got back from my fifth trip out to Iceland. And uh, it was my fifth time out there, but I still run off the plane like Sound of Music style, you know, arms spinning in yours. Like, oh my gosh, so much to shoot here. Um, ironically, uh, worst place to shoot is Iceland. Um, 80 mile an hour winds, and you know, your face freezing off, and uh, it's uh, quite challenging too. So there's times when uh, this last trip I was out there shooting, and literally 80 mile an hour winds, and I wanted this shot, and I'm blowing horizontal, and you're like, why do I do this? But <laughs> it's, a, it's such a great and wonderful place to photograph. Right. It's worth it. Where are you going next? I go to Banff, Canada uh, in two weeks here to teach. So I'll be up there uh, freezing, freezing every part of my body off. What's your Instagram handle? Instagram is Mike Mez, M-E-Z, photo. Mike Mez, photo. Deb, where are you going next? Next, I'm going back to Colorado. I, I love Colorado. I'll go back four times a year. It's different in the spring, different in the summer, different in the winter. Gorgeous in the fall. So. Any specific place in Colorado or all uh, of Colorado? Rocky Mountains, yes. Yeah. At, uh, what is your social handle? What is your Instagram? Deb Sandage. That's so Everywhere. easy. Everywhere. Deb, Deb Sandage. We can do this one. <laughs> Adam, where are you going next? You just said you may be taking a break or are you going somewhere Well, else? I'm going back home to Maine uh, and I'm planning things for next year. I got workshops running up there next year and planning trips. But I just, this, is, like, fall is like my craziest season running around nonstop. So I'm just kind of like decompressing after and the show. Your Instagram handle? A Woodworth Photo. A Woodworth Photo. You can see these guys on the side after we're done. Um, I can't thank you enough for spending time with us. Again, sometimes it's just not about the pictures. It's a story behind making the pictures. I appreciate all of you spending time with us. If you're tuning in on Nikon Live, thank you very much. We got a lot more education to come uh, throughout the day. Um, so thank you guys for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you so much.